Hello and uh, welcome uh, everyone. I am Annabel Gonzalez, uh, Deputy Director General of the WTO. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today for the presentation of the report, Subsidies, Trade and International Cooperation. The report has been prepared jointly by the IMF, uh, the OECD, the World Bank and the WTO. The heads of the four organizations launched the report at a roundtable uh, held two weeks ago as part of the 2022 spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank in Washington, DC. Our event today aims to present the report to the Geneva trade policy community, as well as trade experts in governments, international organizations, and academia from around the world. The report is a result of the close collaboration between our organizations and evidence of our strong resolve to serve our members, not least by providing objective, rigorous, and policy relevant analysis on a topic that has gained increased prominence in recent years. Indeed, subsidies loom large over many of, pre of the pressures facing the rules based trading system. Take the pandemic and now the tragic war in Ukraine. Both crises have strained supply chains and have strengthened the hand of those calling for even larger subsidies to help unwind supply chains, reshore production, or otherwise promote self-sufficiency in strategic sectors. All that despite the fact that trade has been a source of resilience during a once in a century health crisis, having served as a lifeline for millions of people around the world to access food, vaccines, and other essential supplies or consider trade tensions among some of the largest trading blocs. Sharp differences over subsidies lie at the core of those tensions, which have been building up uh, since before the pandemic and have harmed growth and living standards uh, around the world. So there are many good reasons why subsidies need to be addressed and why they need to be addressed now. Dealing constructively with subsidies could go a long way to ease the pressures waiting on the WTO and revitalize global trade. And yet, subsidies have proved to be one of the most challenging issues to deal with when it comes to the developing of trade disciplines. And that is true for subsidies to both agriculture and industry. And of course, it is also true for fishery subsidies. We have known for a long time that subsidies can distort trade and investment flows, undermine the predictability and stability created by trade commitments, and erode public support for open trade. But subsidies are also deeply entwined with critically important efforts by governments around the world to meet old and new challenges, from delivering essential public services to responding, responding to emergencies, and from uh, tackling climate change to fostering the digital transformation. So we also know that some subsidies do good in advancing this and other key development uh, challenges to the benefit of all, but many others do not. And what we see is that many subsidies do not advance their stated goals or do so at a high cost for the domestic economy, the global environment, or other countries, especially the poorest and most vulnerable. So all this points to the need for more collaboration and less confrontation when it comes to dealing with subsidies. And here's how we could start moving in the right direction. First, improve information on subsidies. Second, channel sound evidence and analysis into discussions on subsidies. And third, support efforts by governments to improve international subsidy disciplines, including here at the WTO. So there is much work to do, and who better than the authors of the report to discuss how to take it forward. They are Brad McDonald, Deputy Chief for Trade Policy, External Policies Division at the uh, IMF. Jose Signoret, uh, Senior Economist at the Macro Trade and Investment Global Practice at the World Bank Group. My WTO colleague here, Alex Keck, Chief Global Economic Analysis at our Economic Research and Statistics Division. And last but not least, Julian Nelson, uh, Deputy Director at the Trade and Agricultural Directorate at the OECD. So Brad, Jose, Alex, and Julia, thank you very much for being uh, with us and congratulations to you and to your colleagues uh, on this um, excellent uh, report. Now to provide additional perspectives, we are very lucky to have with us today 
four very distinguished discussants who are renowned experts on the experts on the issues we will discuss today. Andres Sapir, professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, a senior fellow at Bruegel. Chad Baum, Regional Jones Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Tu Ching Kuang, Dean and Professor at the China Institute for WTO Studies at the University of International Business and Economics at China. And Trudy Harsenberg, Executive Director of TRALAC. So thank you all very much for being here with us today, Andre, Chad, uh, Ching Kuang, and Trudy. We are very pleased to have you with us. I also see that we have a large audience, uh, both here, but certainly mostly online. And thank you very much for joining us. For those of you online, please remember to post your questions via the Q&A function of Zoom, and we will come to them at the end of our session. So with all this, let's get uh, started. We will kick off with a presentation of the report by the four coordinators, followed by comments and insight from our ex four experts, and then our Q&A. So, let me now give the floor uh, to Brad. Uh, Brad, please, uh, uh, can you please come in? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Annabelle. Uh, thanks also to the WTO for hosting us uh, today. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody uh, out there. Um, I'd like to begin first uh, with a word about what, what I saw, what we saw as the exemplary teamwork throughout this project because I think it speaks well about our ability and the ability of other international organizations to come together and do this sort of cooperative work. And in this case, as Annabelle mentioned, we had inputs from throughout each of our international organizations. In the WTO, our host today, I know, and I'm, I may be missing some, but I know that there were inputs from the agriculture division, rules, research division, services, and probably others. Uh, similar things were true in the OECD and the World Bank, and, and, and I know from my own experience inside the IMF, we had this similarly broad input. And I should also mention, especially given the event that we had a few weeks ago in Washington, the tremendous support that we had from our communications teams and all the four organizations, which was extremely helpful, and they also helped to shape and, and, and to publish the paper. But I especially want to thank the, thank the co-coordinators We've worked together since our group was composed uh, last April. It's really been a tremendous experience. Um, Alex, Julia, and Jose, but also uh, Mark Maqueta, Antonio de Sephora, and, and others who were very active at, at, at certain times of the process. And they brought to this an approach of professionalism, respect, and commitment. Uh, each, I think, stood up for our own institution's interests, but we also learned to understand where the other institutions were coming from. And we understood that we were ultimately working for the common good and for the good of our common members. So why do I mention this here? Well, I think not only because it was a great experience, I personally learned a great deal, but I really want to underscore how this underscore, how, I really want to underscore what this means for our ability to work together in the future and to continue to benefit our members. So I think it bodes extremely well for future cooperation. Um, I was asked to say a few words about the plan of the presentation, and we're actually going to be following quite closely the order of the paper. So for those who have already read it, that may be helpful. I'm going to kick off with a brief discussion about the motivation behind the paper, the design and rationale of subsidies, and some of the new challenges. Uh, Jose will then discuss the landscape of subsidies globally, including data gaps and weaknesses. Alex will talk about existing rules, and Julia will speak about priorities for, for action. So why this paper and why now? Well, subsidies have long been an issue in global trade. John Jackson summed it up very nicely already a half decade ago. He emphasized then in 1969 that GATT has been concerned with subsidies since its beginning, but that no consensus for any common approach to the problem had been arrived at. Why? He emphasized the difficulty in distinguishing, on the one hand, justifiable policies from, on the other hand, those policies that, in his words, constitute a dangerous and improper attempt to export one's own problems. He also emphasized 50 years ago the worrisome dynamics that he saw, including a tendency for one subsidy to invite counter subsidies by others 
so as to protect their own export markets. And we see this in some of the data today, the data coming through the official WTO notifications, for example, and also I think the data from, from Global Trade Alert and other places. But while the issue is longstanding, it has become more complex and more urgent. There are several important new issues and challenges. I'll elaborate in a minute. But also importantly, there are sharp differences over subsidies today. And these differences, as Annabelle mentioned at the outset, are contributing to global trade tensions that are harming growth. This has a material effect on living standards. The IMF World Economic Outlook estimated in 2019 that US-China trade tensions alone would reduce global income in 2020 in a single year by over a half trillion dollars. In this paper, our specific interest was in subsidies with possibly harmful international effects. In particular, the potential to distort trade or investment, including by eroding the value of existing tariff findings or other market access commitments, or the potential to distort the global commons, such as by promoting output harmful to the global environment. In doing this, we looked at work not only in our own organizations, but, but uh, also in other organizations and sort of and, and throughout. So you see some of this in box one of the paper. This included regional development banks, such as the Asian Development Bank, several UN agencies, including FAO, UNDP, and UNEP, other players like Global Trade Alert and World Resources Institute, and of course, a lot of material from think tanks and academics. We hope that we were able to build well on this really good foundation that exists. Um, Next on subsidies design and rationale. We note in the paper that subsidies can take many forms. These are just a few examples, but direct government spending is one, tax incentives, which could be tax credits or reduced tax rates, equity, and equity infusions, concessional loans, the provision of goods and services on favorable terms and price support policies. Again, these are just examples. And these actions can be taken at many levels, at the national level, supranational level, regional and local, and they can be taken either directly by governments or by other entities under government influence, which can sometimes include state-owned enterprises. And there are sound rationales for subsidies. Investment in basic research and development, for example, and the provision of environmentally friendly goods and services. And at least from a domestic perspective, sometimes exploiting economies of scale. But in that last example, we emphasize that this sort of subsidy, despite their domestic economic motivation, can be very contentious internationally. And while there are sound rationales for some sub subsidies, design matters. Economic analysis can help us help to inform this design. Does the subsidy achieve its stated objective? At what fiscal or quasi-fiscal costs how does the subsidy spill over internationally, such as through trade, investment, the global commons, climate, fish stocks, for example, or through economic development opportunities? Improved design can often achieve better outcomes with fewer negative, effect, negative effects at home and abroad. The next slide, please. New challenges and new debates. There are examples of areas of debate include climate change, digitalization, emergency support, such as economic emergencies, disasters, and health emergencies, supply resilience and supply chains, and the changing role of the state of the state of the state in the economy, especially as state-owned enterprises become more active internationally. Addressing such challenges requires a clear sense of the positive and negative aspects of existing subsidies. And that begins by understanding the current landscape of subsidies in the global economy. Fortunately, we have an expert on hand for just that topic. And I now turn it over to Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Jose, you want to come in, please? Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So, um, 
good good morning good afternoon everyone um so uh we will next provide you with a landscape view of this and and i must say that this is a qualified view of the the global landscape so i'm going to start with some caveats that i think are important to put out um the first one is that uh, there are important gaps in what we know about subsidies um and that is in part because the data is at different stages is it's substantially fragmented we know substantially more about certain sectors more than others uh, and the data is often incomplete in terms of who is providing these uh, subsidies and who is benefiting from these subsidies and what is the amount of support that is uh, is given by by these uh, by these interventions and with that deficiency in the data obviously comes some interpretation complications and they relate to for example the the level uh, the varying level of transparency that exists across countries that complicates the picture because we not always know if more subsidies means that um, these countries are really more subsidizing countries or just simply more open about what they do. And then <clears throat> the fact that because, as I mentioned before, we don't always know the size of these um, intervention, the, the size of the support, the monetary values of them, um, very often we are limited to count the number of, of, of uh, subsidies that are given, the number of, of, uh, of programs or the no number of subsidy measures that are, that are put out. And those counts do not necessarily uh, convey a, a sense of magnitude or even a, a, a notion of how destructive this uh, um, subsidies are. For, for, for certain programs, for certain subsidies, and for certain sectors, we do have some estimates, uh, but that's not generally the case. And finally, uh, in terms of caveat, I think we we'll say that, uh, you know, there is kind of a core area where we people would agree as to what is a subsidy, um, like, you know, providing uh, uh, a very, very clear grant, uh, and so on, but there are other subsidy measures and even subsidy-like measures um, that are kind of what I would call the bound the, the definitional boundaries of what is a subsidy, and uh, that complicates the picture because some countries might consider that action to be a subsidy and then report it or make it public, and some other countries might not consider that to be a subsidy, so that that falls out of the definition and then we got into that complication that um, we might not be talking about the same, you know, comparing apples to apples. Okay, so with all that, uh, sounds pretty, <laughs> pretty bad, but uh, I think we, we wanted to put that out because I think even with those efficiencies, uh, there are some patterns and some, some trends that emerge uh that that we can put out and i think they are quite significant and, and important um number one is that the subsidies are very prevalent uh in fact uh an important fact is that these subsidies have been the most prominent uh form of government intervention since the financial crisis way more than tariff and non-tariff measures the other fact that we know is that because of that increase in the use of subsidies or subsidy actions, that has resulted in subsidies reactions. And the reaction has been in the forms of trade defense mechanisms, um, specifically in the terms in terms of countervailing investigations and eventual countervailing measures. Those has increased dramatically, more, more than more than double in terms of uh, initiation of new cases. So they have more than, than accelerated, uh, two times accelerated in recent years. Um, the other trend that is quite uh, robust is that this is not a single country or not even a single region issue. In fact, when we look at who are the, the governments or the countries that are providing the, the, the largest number of subsidies, um, they, they they cover multiple continents um, and they tend to be concentrated among uh, the largest trading partner, which is kind of important because 
these are the countries precisely that can influence global markets. Then uh, I guess the, the, the next kind of a style like facts that comes out of this uh, global landscape is that subsidies are not a single sector either. We know that um, we talk all the time about agricultural subsidies because they are kind of a large number and, and, and believed to be highly distortive. But the fact is that subsidies go beyond agriculture, they cover manufacturing sectors, they cover services, they are services uh, subsidies that are quite common and prevalent in the data. So many sectors are affected by subsidies. Um, the other point, which I, um, Brad already alluded to, is that there is a, a wide range of forms in which these subsidies take, take form. Some of them are financial grants, some can be soft or preferential loans, or even tax breaks. And there is variation across countries as to what, what is the, the, the type of subsidy measure that is implemented. Uh, for example, in the European Union, grants might be more prevalent, while in the United States, some tax break can be the preferred way of providing subsidies. And the last point, which is kind of interesting, is that, you know, when we talk about subsidies and government subsidies, we need to think about government, not only about the central authorities, but now this, the subnational entities. And the, the fact is that most subsidy programs by counts are actually provided at the more local level. So this can be US states, there can be Chinese provinces and so on. So we need to keep that unit of analysis clear because it, it goes into uh, more than cent the, central, the central government. Then uh, some final sectoral observations, I mentioned this already, uh, the support to agriculture is significant. We know uh, uh, um, a, a little bit more about subsidies in agriculture due to you know, long work of uh, estimating this uh, at the OECD. And uh, as with subsidies in general, they tend to be concentrated. Uh, in particular, there are four big countries that account for, for the large majority of, of subsidies in agriculture. The, the European Union, China, US, and India. We also know that fossil fuels remain high, and I should say sadly, remain high. Um, and um, that subsidies to the services sector is actually quite common, uh, specifically in areas like financial, transportation, construction. Uh, but the information on, on, on the level of support is not, is not, is not, is not, is not there. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned before, also subsidies are every time more common in, in, in the form of industrial subsidies, very prevalent. Uh, and again, as in services, we don't have a complete uh, picture on those. We know that they are in many sectors of of manufacturing sectors. We do have some uh, ideas as, you know, building from case studies that has been done in several industries like the semiconductor industry and the aluminum industry. Uh, but, you know, how to generalize that into the manufacturing sector in general is something that, uh, you know, remains as a gap. And, the last point is the role of subsidies, uh, the role of SOEs, sorry, in, in subsidies that seems to be quite important and actually in, in a two way sense. Um, SOEs as beneficiaries, as you know, being close to the government and, and, and benefiting from that close relationship with the, go for, with the government, uh, but also SOEs as provider of subsidies, as a strategic actors to. Uh, provide uh, you know critical input to, to other industries, whether it's transportation, utilities, or financial uh, subsidies through you know state banks and so on. Uh, but even though we know that the role is there and is uh, important and, and every time increasing, uh, is is actually harder to 
to figure out the, the information on subsidization from these SOEs because then you need to start talking about, okay, um, you know, there is a, there's a loan provided by a, an SOE bank. What is the level of the subsidy? So basically what is, what is the, the preference relative to what would have been the commercial basis of that loan? So it, it's, a, it's a more complicated calculation. Uh, but but just to put it out there, that's another uh, important fact that comes is a, is increasing role of um, um, not the government but other entities acting in behalf of the government or benefiting from close link uh, to the government. That's that's all from me. I, I pass it to Alex. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Jose and Brad and Annabelle in particular, it was a great experience working with you all with the co-coordinators, but also with, with colleagues here in the house. Um, a tremendous um, experience of, of uh, collaboration. Now, this is of course, principally an economic study, um, but it also contains a chapter on existing international rules on subsidies. The purpose of this chapter is obviously not to provide a comprehensive overview over these rules. Of course, there's a a focus on WTO rules in particular, but also on others like OECD export credit arrangements and other areas of international rulemaking. Now, what is the purpose of this chapter really? Um, now, when sort of talking about the fact that action on international subsidies is right now a very topical issues, issue, we wanted to make sure to also emphasize that such a discussion builds on and starts from a very solid basis of existing rules. In the case of WTO rules um, that have served uh, members well for over 25 years now. But precisely these over 25 years now have also shown that the application, the operation of these rules has sometimes been challenging and has given the impression that there is uh, room for more precision or maybe for some additions. Now, let me give you some of these examples. And in some of these examples, I think what is interesting also shows um, that the rulemaking itself has actually been data-driven and analysis-driven in many cases, or supported by data and analysis, and has also often faced this kind of trade-off that, that Brad was alluding to at the very beginning, between which makes this topic so complex. So what is a subsidy that is very highly distortive compared to a subsidy that is uh, very necessary to fulfill some public policy objectives. Let me give you some examples, starting with the SCM agreement, the Agreement on Subsidies and Countervailing Measures, which governs, governs trade in good. Now here, for instance, you find a very elaborate and sophisticated definition of what is a subsidy. Elements of these definitions include, there must be a financial contribution by the government or a public body, a, a benefit must be conferred, and the subsidy must be specific, for instance, to a specific enterprise. Now, this sounds all very, very detailed. In practice, there have been with several of these issues, um, um, complexities that maybe were not so an anticipated or that have come more to the fore in recent times. For instance, determining if a given entity that appears to be a commercial enterprise is actually a public body has not been a straightforward exercise in practice. And this is especially true, as, as Jose also uh, said, in the case of SOEs that uh, are increasingly international uh, active. Um, another important pillar of the SCM agreement is its categorization of subsidies, which precisely is, uh, is trying to reflect maybe this trade-off that, that, um, uh, that Brad has alluded to. These categories which comprise prohibited subsidies, actional subsidies, and until 99, when some provisions were allowed to elapse, there were also a group that were non-actionable subsidies. So again, prohibited subsidies, subsidies that are uh, very highly uh, uh, distortive in international trade, and at the other spectrum, non-actional subsidies, perhaps subsidies like at the time it was subsidies for regional development, uh, environmental adaptations, R&D, um, where this, that are probably less uh, trade distortive and more public policy oriented. And, uh, and the actional subsidies uh, obviously is, is, uh, are subsidies that have trade impacts, but 
in order to remedy these trade impacts, certain effects, adverse effects need to be shown, which in itself has proven to be a, a very uh, elaborate and complex exercise. Um, so again, with the experience in hindsight, um, it, for instance, it has been, it has been shown that um, remedies to counter prohibited subsidies are relatively straightforward because the remedy is simply the withdrawal of the measure. Whereas for actionable, actionable subsidies, as I said, um, it's much more complex um, to be able to, to take remedial action. So some are now arguing uh, whether it shouldn't be discussed to extend this list of prohibited subsidies. Others are arguing, for instance, within the actionable category, shouldn't there be discussions uh, to reverse some of the burden of, of proof in the context of demonstrating adverse effects. Others are arguing that this non-actionable subsidy group should be revived and perhaps uh, extended. Um, and, and, uh, and another very important pillar that comes back to the, the, the shortage of data on subsidies is that the SEM agreement contains very precise um, obligations on transparency and in particular on notifications. Now the compliance with these notifications is very low. And, and, and clearly this would be a very first step to have some more um, fundamental discussion on what may need to be done to have a better overview of the practices of, of members. So here now, um, and this is not only in, in the subsidies context, clearly there are discussions taking place on how the right incentives could be or should be set to improve this notification record. Now, very briefly then, in subsidies, you have also, again, driven by the market realities, you have some more specific agreements or sectoral agreements or sectoral discussions like longstanding now um, agreement also on agriculture, which has an important, uh, sec uh, important um, rules on subsidies. And again, here, one of the main pillars is this category, categorization of that tries to do this trade-off between more distortive and minimally or less uh, uh, trade distorting subsidies. And here again, the experience has shown that this categorization is, is very difficult at times, that maybe the green box for certain countries uh, and members was ballooning, um, which was not expected in this way, and other members would have different views whether uh, this, uh, a certain measure actually falls in this box or another. Um, in agriculture as well, the same problem, transparency and, um, uh, and in particular compliance with notifications obligations has been low. The latest data we had for this study shows that, for instance, for this all important uh, domestic support notification, um, the compliance rate is about 33% and the distribution across members has very fat tails. So there are some 25 members who, who comply 100% with their obligation and then there are about 28 or so members who have really zero compliance. And I just, for completeness reasons, I also want to mention, of course, this, uh, this sort of data-driven or, uh, or context-driven importance to discuss and to refine rules and to develop further rules, as we've currently seen with fish. There is this SDG mandate to address fish. Fishery subsidies have been shown to um, contribute to overcapacity. Um, so these are very uh, important discussions that are, are going on. And the study shows, and uh, Jose has mentioned it, that we have, even in the field of services, a lot of subsidies. Now, the question is why, and we have some rules that apply to services subsidies already, MFN, transparency, but members by and large, and even N national treatment applies to subsidy measures if the sector has been scheduled. But many members have scheduled very extensive uh, limitations for subsidies on national treatment. And on the mandate to negotiate subsidies disciplines and service, nothing has been happening for a long time. And that contrasts somewhat with the empirical observation that um, many of these subsidies, uh, that many services sectors also um, uh, are uh, benefiting from uh, subsidies or are, are, are receiving subsidies. So the question is, why is there such a lack of progress in these negotiations? And the report gives some answers, and, and one of these answers is, uh, is, is perhaps um, similar as what we have observed with, uh, with goods, actually, over the time of the GATT, that in services, there are still many, many other distortions, uh, quantitative restrictions, economic needs tests, discriminatory measures that are sort of allowed, so that there's 
less of an appetite perhaps to address some of the other measures such as, such as sub subsidies. And for completeness, I also and, uh, wanted to mention that since Brad um, and Jose also mentioned the, the, the importance of fossil fuel subsidies and the data we have on that, the contribution that they may make to, um, to, to CO2 emissions, it's also noteworthy that some uh, 45 members or so here in the WTO have started to a, a plurilateral initiative on addressing fossil fuel subsidies, which again faces some of the difficult trade-offs uh, that the other areas also have known. So in sum, um, I don't want to repeat myself, uh, existing rules provide a strong basis, but there are long-standing gaps that we all know of. Know of. There are more recently exposed gaps, but the experience has also shown that improved transparency analysis and more dialogue has helped to, ve to develop better rules. And I think this also applies uh, in going forward. And we were also wondering what the international organization secretaries can contribute in that effort. So I'm handing over now to Julia. Um, thank you, Alex, and it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I'm gonna pick up next slide, please, um, from my colleagues, because really, uh, as we've said, you know, the, the hub of the issue here is what's a good subsidy? And that's an issue that really warrants conversation. And we had our own very, I think, very productive and very useful conversations amongst ourselves. But the reason, as I think my colleagues have said, why it needs discussion is firstly, it's not, it's the impact on everybody else. It's those international spillovers. It's the impact on the rules-based multilateral trading system. But it's also a domestic discussion. It's a discussion about the use of scarce domestic resources. Because if we get this wrong, there's an awful lot of schools, hospitals and roads that are not going to get built while we give companies money to do things they would have done anyway. So in having this discussion, uh, we have a toolkit of several <coughs> things that are necessary if we're going to move forward. And I'll go through them. We highlight in the report transparency and analysis. We highlog we highlight consultation and dialogue, and we talk about rules and norms as that toolkit. And in all of those areas, we as international organisations are looking to help uh, your efforts. Um, and also, this is a conversation that's going to involve many uh, other players. The first area, though, that I think emerges from the report is that transparency is really fundamental. We need to understand what's going on so that we can debate and discuss it. I think the report and my colleagues have highlighted the areas where we know things, where we don't know things. And there's a very nice table in, in Annex E which highlights the, the areas where there are our subsidy collections, both by our four organisations, but also by others. And I think going forward, the, the effort that we're looking to do is how can we maximise the benefit of the work that we and others have done? How can we coordinate and pool our efforts better? How can we identify those gaps and get a much better information base through having a, a kind of targeted push? The other area that really matters uh, is in this question of analysis. Sorry, can we go back? I'm still on transparency and analysis. So one of the things that we highlight in the report is that understanding impacts is a very important part of, I think as Brad described it, this is about getting better outcomes and getting better outcomes from from everyone. And getting it right is actually not very easy. So some of the areas that we highlight which could benefit from further analysis are some of the roles of subsidies in development. Are there particular kinds of market failures in developing countries which require use of subsidies? In some areas, we know quite a bit about the impact of subsidies in rich countries on developing countries. But with the overall tendency to see an increase of the, the role of government, especially post-crisis, an increasing growth industry of subsidies. This is probably an area that requires renewed attention. Equally, we're looking in the context of environmental challenges. There's real urgency to act but this also means two things. It means stop doing bad stuff and try and do good stuff. So we need to know, firstly, what's the environmental impacts of some of our existing subsidies. We also need to know if we're trying to target the, the kind of market failures that we need to address to get the urgent action on climate change. How do we design those subsidies in a way that they will be effective without creating negative spillovers on others? The digital transformation is, is likewise an area where whether you're talking about policy uh, uh, objectives related to 
investments in R&D, whether you're talking about domestic production capacity, whether you're talking about trying to foster competition, these are all areas where there is a need to understand how to design a subsidy in order to get what, is, what the answers that you're, you're looking for. In terms of the role of the state, my colleagues have talked a lot about that and the role of SOEs. The thing I'd highlight is that we're seeing that SOEs are now more international and particularly post-crisis, we're seeing a higher role of the state across many economies. So this really adds weight to the idea that we need to have a closer look and to understand better what are the impacts of those different roles of the state in the economy and of SOEs. This is also linked to the, to the last issue, which is we have seen in recent times and we will see going forward um, a huge need for emergency support. And it's played a very important role in COVID-19 and in other areas. But design matters. Uh, how you design that support going in affects whether and how you get out, affects its effectiveness at the time and impacts the, the effect of that support on others and on global markets. And so as we see that uh, post the COVID-19, governments are playing a much bigger role in the economy, this really underlines the need to understand how to design that emergency support. So one of the areas that we really highlight, and this is an area where all four of us are looking to help uh, our members more, is on that baseline of information that helps us understand and answer those two questions about who pays and who benefits because that goes to the heart of understanding what kind of subsidy you're dealing with. Next slide please. So on the basis of that uh, is the transparency that analysis helps to to underpin the really critical next step, which is about consultation and dialogue. Um, subsidies are notoriously hard to reform, as we've seen across many areas. So reform is easier when others are doing it as well. So this is why a cooperative approach, a dialogue is absolutely essential. But it's also essential because you can learn from others' experience in terms of how to design subsidies, but also how to reform them in the most appropriate way. But you can also ensure, and this is where we see a real need in the international system, to ensure that those debates are based on evidence, that it helps find the, the kinds of solutions and ways through, through looking in very practical terms at unpacking the, the detail of design. We have a number of mechanisms uh, which are outlined in the report across all four organisations, and there are others, including uh, bringing in some of the other players who are very active in this area. Lastly, I'd pick up the, the issue which, as Alex mentioned, is rules and norms. And we have a very good basis here, as he mentioned, but we also have, as, as Brad and Jose have both mentioned, some new issues and pressures. Some of them are external, such as climate change. We're seeing more emergencies. Some of them are seeing, some of them are more policy induced, including the role of the state. So there are some issues that perhaps weren't around 20 or 30 years ago, which require us to have another look at how we're designing and how we're implementing and what we're doing with government support. Uh, as we've also all highlighted, design matters. So in taking this forward, it also means that you can improve the operation of the existing rules by being better informed on how the shape of the existing rules that we have. And so lastly, uh, I guess this is a task that is more for everybody in this house, which is, uh, and I know it's one that you spend a lot of time thinking about, is how to develop those effective, balanced new rules and norms um, that feeds on this transparency, builds on the analysis and dialogue uh, to help us all end up with good subsidies that both hit their target, uh, don't impose high costs on others or domestically, and result in, in the better outcomes for all. So to, to end where I began, this is the, the start of, uh, of a conversation. Uh, we know uh, it's a very difficult conversation, but we hope that this report um, and our contributions will make that conversation easier and more fruitful for you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, and thanks to uh, Alex, uh, Jose, and uh, Brad for the presentation of the report. Uh, before moving on, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Martin Kaufman, who right now is Assistant Director and Korea Missions Chief for the Asia and Pacific Department of the IMF, and who in his previous capacity played a lead role in this uh, study. Uh, so Martin, let us hear a few reflections uh, from, from your side, uh, please. You have the floor. 
Thank you, Annabelle. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is uh, good to be here today. Uh, so the launch of this paper is not just the high point of a joint project, but of our close collaboration among international organizations. So this project started nearly four years ago in Bali during a conference at the um, annual meetings uh, to launch a previous joint paper, in fact. And it was the initiative of the WTO started by, by Bob Koopman at the time of high trade tensions. So four years later, the issue remains as relevant as it was back then and its purpose as important. So let me make three points on what we learned from this project related to the original motive of the project, the broad and, and global re relevance of the topic and its contributions to helping find constructive ways to limit global fragmentation risks. On the first point, the original motive of this project was related to helping strengthen the multilateral system and address some of the uh, underlying sources of tensions. And notice here that I'm, I'm talking about the multilateral system and trade and tensions generally, because it was already apparent at that time that tensions challenged the entire mul multilateral system, not just one pillar and many areas, not just trade, as the increasing conflation with other economic issues became quite apparent. So the choice of trade distorting subsidies for our joint project was deliberate to indicate that we saw it as critical to tackle fundamental issues, even if complex and sensitive. On the broad relevance of the issue of subsidies, let me say that all of our institutions had focused in the past on distortionary subsidies from the lenses of our respective institutional uh, mandates. And we knew that their impact uh, can be pervasive. Subsidies can distort trade and investment, can hinder development in low-income countries and emerging markets, and can affect saving and investment and therefore contribute to global imbalances, which is another source of, of uh, tension. But this uh, project emphasized that it required a whole of government effort. In fact, in this case, it would be more like a whole of international organizations effort to understand the complex web of effects and how to pursue better policies. So this whole of IOS effort will be key going forward to address these and other pressing issues to the broader, for the broader multilateral system. And my third and last point on what this project means more broadly for finding constructive ways to limit global fragmentation risks we're deeply aware that global fragmentation risks are, are very high at present and, and helping to contain those risks require broad and, and sustained efforts that include several areas, including demonstrating clearly and, and credibly the cost of unfettered fragmentation globally and at the country level, pinpointing specific areas where the detrimental effects will be greatest, but also addressing concerns about the sources of distortions in the system, which will be critical to reduce tensions in a durable, in a durable way. All these need analysis that is balanced, impartial, and comprehensive. And this is where e efforts such as this joint paper come in. So let me finish by saying that uh, this project has further crystallized the importance of helping to contain fragmentation risks, and that such efforts will require tackling critical issues, even if sensitive, using a whole of IEO's effort, even if complex, and zeroing on sources of distortions, even if harder. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for uh, those reflections and for your contributions. And while I'm in this uh, thanking mode, let me also recognize uh, the role of uh, Bob Koopman, our chief economist here at the WTO, uh, Mona Haddad, uh, director for trade at the World Bank, Marion Jensen, uh, director of agriculture and trade at OECD, and uh, Jeremy Settelmeyer, deputy director of the strategic uh, strategy and policy review department, who's also here with us uh, today. So uh, with that, uh, let us now bring into the into our conversation our four discussions. discussions. I will ask please each one of you uh, to react to what you've heard so far uh, and to offer your views on what the report gets right, where it could go further 
and what is needed to start seeing concrete actions on subsidies and uh, at the WTO um, and beyond. Uh, we are already getting a good number of uh, questions. So for those of you who are interested, please remember um, to go to the Q&A function. So let me now turn the uh, floor to Andre Sapir. Uh, Andre, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Annabel. It's a, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, reading this uh, this rich uh, report. As a commentator, my my choice was to focus on one or two uh, issues and get into the depth of it, or to stay at a more uh, general uh, level. Uh, I hope that you will bear with me. Uh, with the fact that uh, I have chosen the, uh, the second uh, option and stay at a general level. Now, there are two possible readings uh, of the report. One is as an attempt to improve on the work done by researchers like those at the Global Trade Alert, been mentioned several times in the presentations, and map out the use and misuse of subsidies throughout the world using the tremendous resources of the four IOs, uh, which have co-authored the report. The second reading is to look uh, at uh, this report as, as an agenda, an agenda for future work, alerting the international community of a growing problem, the use and misuse of subsidies, growing because, as the report uh, indicates rightly, uh, there are a number of new uh, challenges climate change, digitization, uh, emergencies like the pandemic or, or not the war, uh, resilient uh, supply chains, and the issue of uh, state-owned uh, enterprises. Now, in this second reading, uh, the agenda uh, put forward by the report uh, amounts or would amount uh, as a mandate uh, that the four IOs are in effect seeking from their, from their members, from their shareholders, to collect data on subsidies and to do impact analysis, to engage in consultation and dialogue with their members, and finally, uh, to seek to help their members to improve uh, international rules and norms uh, that, seems to be, that seem to be lacking. If read in the first light, the report is a bit disappointing it does not add very much to the catalog already established by researchers like those at the Global Trade Alert, uh, would do a job with certainly far less resources than the four IOs. However, if read in the second light as an agenda, then I think the report does become really very, very interesting and indeed uh, very hopeful to deal with this very complex uh, problem. But hopeful uh, does not mean uh, that the, the report uh, always uh, manages, I think, uh, to chart uh, the future uh, in a very uh, easy, uh, easy manner. Uh, let me take just two examples of where I, I can see some difficulties in this very important work uh, that the report charts uh, forward. First is that indeed, I think the, the, the five challenges that I've, have been identified, uh, going from the uh, climate issues to the SOEs, uh, each of them are really big issues. Um, so you know, to tackle five of those issues, uh, this is really extremely, uh, extremely, extremely ambitious. And uh, you know, I, th I think they all they, they all deserve uh, the attention. But I think this is uh, an extremely uh, an extremely ambitious uh, task. Now, ambition is is good, and such and certainly to have uh, four institutions cooperate on an ambitious task is good. But one should not sort of underestimate the uh, the importance of of the task. The second reason for uh, guarded uh, Optimism, optimism, but nonetheless guarded, is that the priorities for action put forward by the report, transparency and impact analysis, consultation and dialogue, and finally uh, improving rules and norms, 
are premised, as the report indicates very clearly, on two principles that probably most of us uh, in attendance uh, would take for granted. And those two principles are, first, that some subsidies are appropriate, are even good, uh, based on you know, the notion of market failures and market failures that need to be corrected by state intervention and by uh, including by, uh, by subsidies. But nonetheless, uh, even though there may be good reason for subsidies, uh, there is always the possibility uh, that there is uh, abuse and that uh, some subsidies uh, are, are certainly uh, misused. The second premise, the second principle, is that international cooperation um, should, uh, should aim to address negative spillovers from uh, subsidies. Now, the question I'd like to, to ask, in a sense, to the, uh, to the authors uh, of the report, but again, I think to, to the to, to, to the international community is, uh, are we really sure that countries, global countries, all the countries, all the 64, 164 members of the WTO, for instance, do they all really share a common understanding of what is an appropriate or good uh, subsidy and also what constitutes negative spillovers, harmful uh, spillovers? Uh, I would suggest that this deserves uh, really a lot of, uh, of our attention. Now, experience has shown that the issue of subsidies, even among advanced countries, can be, can be quite tricky. Uh, we all know the, uh, the long-standing fights between the European Union and the, uh, and the United States uh, about Airbus and, uh, and Boeing. And uh, we also know that even inside the EU, uh, which admittedly has the most advanced international regime of rules and norms in the world for the control of subsidies, even within the EU, uh, there are sometimes tensions uh, about uh, subsidies. So when it comes to, to the world, to, to the entire membership of the uh, IMF, uh, the World Bank, uh, the WTO, obviously, the, the membership of the of the OECD is is a, is a narrow world, narrower one. But so, when you look beyond the advanced uh, economies, and uh, you look at this diversity of countries in the world, I think I want to finish by flagging two diversities among the membership uh, that seem to me to be absolutely central uh, to many of the trade issues, including subsidies that need to be addressed with priority. One is very clearly laid out in, in, in the report, uh, but I think could get, uh, and admittedly very complicated, could get some more uh, attention, is indeed the issue of the coexistence of different economic models and, uh, and, and roles of the states and SOEs in, in, in the world. Uh, we need really to uh, to deal, I think, with uh, with that uh, issue uh, very very urgently. The second one, which is addressed also in the report, perhaps a bit, a bit less, is the coexistence of advanced and developing countries uh, with diff sometimes different rules and norms embodied in the notion of special and uh, differential uh, treatment uh, that has been plaguing. Uh, I think the WTO for quite a while. And here I think, and I conclude with that, uh, the, the, the point that I want to make there is, you know, is, is related to this issue of negative, uh, negative spillovers. What are the negative spillovers? Uh, one can look at negative spillovers as the fact that uh, incumbents uh, regard subsidies that are given by newcomers as being harmful to them. Uh, and that's certainly the, the way uh, incumbents are looking at the issue, but that's perhaps not the way that the uh, newcomers uh, are dealing with the, with the issue. And that's why I wanted to say that, you know, principles that are in the report that are probably self-evident to, to many of us may not always be uh, so self-evident to a, a very uh, diverse membership 
of the organizations involved in the in the report. So let me thank again the authors and congratulate them for for the report and and commend uh, the the reading of this uh, very very rich report. Thank you, Annabel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for your for your comments. Uh, let me now turn over to Chad Baun, uh, please. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, and so uh, let me also begin by saying congratulations to the authors uh, and the four institutions for providing uh, a very timely and needed and frankly overdue um, report on these issues. I'm going to agree with Andre, and I'm so glad that he went first because he covered a lot of the ground better than I would have, and it makes me not have to repeat um, what he was what he was covering. Um, but let me also say I'm going to read the report the same way that he did, which is basically this is an agenda um, for the four institutions to take forward to get a mandate uh, from their stakeholders to be able to do more. Uh, and so with that in mind, let me um, offer some some comments. I guess what's what you expect in any report like this, if you're the authors, um, is hopefully uh, you, you make everybody a little bit mad. Um, you know, there are some things that everybody that you're going to like as a, as a reader, then they think they covered well and some things that they um, they left out. So let me give you a, a couple of what I, things that I liked and a couple of things that I think were, were omitted. So um, like Andre, I was very pleased to see the focus on trying to use economics to understand um, what it is that we're talking about here, whether it's defining a subsidy, measuring it talking about the international externalities, the quote, harmful international effects, page five, and then seeking to measure that. And I think it's critical to both define it so that non-economists understand what it is that we're talking about and to be very, very clear about that, but then also the importance of measuring it uh, when, we, when we do our economic analysis so we can talk about magnitudes and sizes. But not only do we need to do that, but we need to go further than just talking about the subsidies. And there's some um, conversation of this in there. And, and again, I think uh, in her presentation, Julia really focused on this, talking about the extra or the, the market failures, trying to define what the market failure is, trying to measure what the market failure or the positive externality say of some activity that you're trying to subsidize, trying to get a handle on what that thing is that the government's policy intervention is trying to tackle so that we can understand is the subsidy doing its job or not? Is it too big? Is it too small? Without actually assessing the magnitude of that thing, then just talking about subsidies in the abstract is kind of in and of itself a meaningless exercise. So I would just kind of push you to, to follow through on, I think, some of the points that, 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 that Julie indicated. And let me give you an, a, one specific example to kind of drive that point home. Um, because I think the issue that we're, we have been traditionally focused on when we think about cooperation on subsidies, it's trying to get countries to cooperate on limiting subsidies. I think what this research agenda needs to also consider is the need for the international community to better cooperate on enhancing the kinds of subsidies that we need globally. And so let me give you a couple of examples. I, right now I'm in uh, New Hampshire in the United States at, at Dartmouth College, and I spent the last three days dealing with uh, vaccine public health experts. Um, some economists, not really our, our normal trade crowd. Uh, and the number that they point to is that the value, the social value of a vaccine, the social value, the course of a vaccine um, is something, the best economic evidence put out by a team led by Michael Kramer, right? The Nobel Prize winner is these things were around $6,000. Governments subsidize them, subsidize manufacturing, uh, so bought them from the companies, paid somewhere in the range of $6 to $40 for something that per course has a $6,000 social value in terms of saving lives, saving economic activity. So the super huge question is, why were those subsidies so, so small? And why weren't there more of them and why weren't they better coordinated? And those are the kind of things that we need to understand uh, and we need to be able to contribute to that debate as well. Instead, in the international community, we talk about, we focused all of our time negotiating over waiving intellectual property rights, which in the short run, we're gonna have zero impact on encouraging earlier, faster, bigger production of vaccines to save the world and economic activity. Why was that? Second, in a world with global supply chains, vaccines are a super good example. You can't produce more output unless you've got 
the inputs. But if the inputs, because of supply chains, are located in another country, that means you need to encourage subsidies not only of the vaccine manufacturers, the output makers, but you need to encourage subsidies of the input makers too. That's the kind of cooperation in a world of cross-border supply chains that we're well aware of needs to take place. It's very different from the conversations that we're having today about cooperating on limiting subsidies. Third, climate, right? Here's a perfect example, global public good. Why aren't we coordinating subsidies uh, on these new technologies, transferring technology uh, to make this happen? Obviously there's a good stuff in the report about disciplining um, bad subsidies to fossil fuels, totally correct, but why aren't we encouraging discussion Discussing more about how to encourage the right types of subsidies that we need to be doing. And then my fourth and final example, and maybe this is the hardest one, um, globalization, economic activity, efficiency, our existing trade rules have led to some economic outcomes which are not socially optimal in terms of excessive geographic concentration of certain economic activities. So we can talk about the semiconductor examples. And this really doesn't have anything to do with the shortage problem. It's just that for perfectly good economic reasons, economies of scale, agglomeration, have led arguably to an excessive concentration of especially the high-end semiconductors in basically two places in the world, Taiwan and South Korea. And I love Taiwan and South Korea. So this is nothing against Taiwan and South Korea. But from a global social planner perspective, in a world in which we've got so many different kinds of shocks now, whether it's climate, whether it's pandemics and public health, uh, whether it's geopolitical risk, excessive concentration of economic activity, um, either geographically, but also within firms is not good for the global economy and the trading system. We need to think about how to deal with that. And if we focus our efforts on saying, well, this is just countries trying to reshore this stuff back to home, I don't think that's what they're trying to do. I think they're worried about avenues for resilience to get increased diversification. We need to contribute to that debate as well. And that's a form of international cooperation that's different from what we are talking about. And I think what the authors of this report are talking about here. So a huge congratulations to the authors for setting in a basic agenda. But even that, I think we still have a lot of ways to go in some of these new and emerging issues on global cooperation on, on subsidies. So good luck and keep it going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chad, for your comments. Uh, let me now turn it over to uh, Tu Ching Kwan. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, DJ Gonzalez, for inviting me to join such a distinguished group. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the excellent team for preparing such a timely and high quality report on such an important and challenging issue as subsidies. Uh, this report has already attracted wide, wide attention of Chinese academia. Uh, three days ago, more than 100 Chinese scholars gathered to have a thorough discussion about this report. Uh, today, I would like to share with you my own observations on this report, as well as the issue of subsidies. Uh, first, I agree with uh, uh, many points in the report, especially the two points stated in the part of priorities for action. Uh, cooperation must uh, recognize that uh, sub some subsidies are appropriate and international cooperation should aim to address negative spillovers uh, from subsidies while accommodating their role in delivering essential public services and addressing market failures. Andrew also noticed uh, these two points. I think the two points are really uh, fundamental and balanced. Uh, unlike those negative interventions like tariffs, which are bad in principle and justified under, uh, only under exceptional uh, circumstances, subsidies or positive governmental uh, in interventions are not bad in nature, but are subject to certain constrained conditions. The basic debate is actually about the role of the state in economic and social development. While we have basically common belief in market economy, we have different expectations on the role of the state because of different development stages, external environment, and cultures. Uh, in many countries, governments are considered indispensable good rather than necessary evil. Subsidies are a legitimate and handy tool for governments to meet the needs of their constituencies. D 
despite divergent political systems. So I think the international discussions and the cooperation on subsidies should focus on their external impact rather than domestic effects. The latter should be mainly dealt with through their own domestic political processes of those countries. Of course, no one can guarantee that all subsidies will fulfill the designed goals and subsidies have their uh, opportunity cost, but that is subject to their own governance uh, capability. While international society should, could provide some technical assistance to improve the quality of subsidy design and implementation, the problems should be left to those independent governments. Secondly, uh, since there is no clear cut benchmark to differentiate good or bad subsidies, uh, the current traffic light approach in WTO rules should be remained, which means that a limited group of good and uh, bad subsidies with broad consensus should be identified as non-actionable or uh, prohibited subsidies respectively. I believe the revival of non-actionable subsidies is more critical in terms of balancing the discussions about subsidies. The existing subsidy uh, studies are mainly targeting at the negative effects of subsidies as a series of uh, OECD studies of market distortions in selected industries. But we need to pay more attention to identify the positive effects or insignificant international spillover effects of certain types of subsidies, as just mentioned by Chad. Otherwise, some, uh, some subsidies are theoretically good, but in practice, all of them are actionable or challengeable. Uh, many countries will be reluctant to take part in the discussions and especially to disclose more information about their subsidies because they are afraid of being challenged under the current WTO rules. So I think it is an urgent need to revive the type of non-actionable or permissible uh, subsidies with an updated list. Thirdly, uh, subsidies are not a new issue and should be reviewed from a historical and a developmental perspective. Countries at different level of development will have different goals in terms of in industrial development. The purpose of traditional industrial policy for the followers is mainly import substitution, which could help establish their own industries. While for the leaders, it is to develop new upstream industries with dominant or monopolistic powers. Therefore, the leaders will invest more in cutting edge scientific and technological innovation, which is often justified as IND investment or subsidies, while the followers will focus on technological absorption and establishment of manufacturing capacity, which is often criticized as important subsidies. Import, import substitution subsidies. I, I don't think this is fair. While the leaders subsidize IND for good reasons of positive externalities, those followers are also dealing with certain sorts of market failures. Take a semiconductor industry as an example, which is highly capital intensive. As uh, one uh, report uh, by semiconductor, uh, the US semiconductor Industrial Association said, no other industry has the same high level of investment in both IND and capital expenditure as a semiconductor. This means that it is more easily to be monopolized or dominated by a few powerful companies. It is very difficult for latecomers to enter the market. This is why the authorities of Japan, Korea, Chinese Taiwan played a critical role at the early stage of early stages of establishment of their own semiconductor industries. China is now learning from them and more eager to do so because China itself is a much larger user of chips and facing more complicated geopolitical environment and increasingly strict export control. So China's industrial policy in semiconductor is to deal with a severe market failure already existing in this industry and to nurture the development of market rather than to disrupt the market. China has never imposed any restrictions on imports or exports. Actually, we are seeking to import more from the US and other suppliers. Also, China's government support is available to both domestic and multinational companies. 
sometimes even more preferential to the latter, simply because they could help us in terms of meeting with the domestic demand. Actually, 75% of capacity in China belongs to multinationals. Uh, finally, uh, since uh, there is a big gray area between good and bad subsidies, countries should uh, impose due restraint on those actionable subsidies. Uh, strict rules on the use of countervailing duties are necessary. Even though some actions have to be taken or should be taken, uh, it is better to adopt comparable uh, subsidies rather than import restrictions, uh, because the former is more pro competition than the latter. Uh, this is not only competition between businesses, but also between governments in terms of their governance ability to design and implement effective and efficient subsidies. Uh, I'm gonna stop here, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Xinquan, for, for your remarks. And uh, let, last but not least, uh, let me please uh, invite uh, Trudy Hartzenberg uh, to take the floor, Trudy. Thank you so much, Annabelle, and thank you so much to the authors of this very important report. It comes at a time where, certainly from a developing country perspective, and um, I'm going to make my points from the vantage point of Africa as I'm joining you from the southern tip of the continent, as we're negotiating the imperative of a post-pandemic transformation. From Africa's perspective, we're also looking at the very important industrialization initiatives that have now moved from national sub-regional to continental level within the context of the African continental free trade area. I think the report provides very important food for thought for taking this analysis further. There are a lot of technical issues that my colleagues have referred to here already, design, measurement, rationale, impact assessment, and moving in a sense from, from the kind of preconception almost that, that subsidies relate more to competition than to cooperation, raises a number of important issues about the confluence of disciplines and disciplines in particular, such as investment and competition, where we still have significant governance gaps at the multilateral governance level. From an African perspective, certainly we see this the use of subsidies as an important part of our broader development agenda. So we're re really looking at the good subsidies that, that my colleagues have been referring to. I think if we take a look at some of the important issues that we're navigating as a continent, and um, I'm focusing very much on the industrialization agenda, although of course, agricultural subsidies and subsidies in the services and digital sectors are very, very important as well, and also offer significant opportunities for the kind of cooperation that Chad has been mentioning here to bridge the digital divide, for example, to take a look at how our commodity dependent economies can actually transition away from, for example, fossil fuels, fuels to a green transition, to a just transition. As far as Africa is concerned, I think particularly important at the moment, we are competing for foreign direct investment and foreign direct investment in particular from global sources. And therefore there is what we might call incentive competition as far as subsidies is concerned. A very important challenge that we do perceive there are issues related to policy capture and policy capture by some of the large multinational corporations that do come to invest and locate their productive capacities in, in our economies. We are experimenting with various configurations of special economic zones, for example. And so these are quite important to take a look at in the broader context of a cooperative model rather than a competitive model. The cooperation model is also particularly important because it can be very important in terms of assisting African countries to integrate effectively into global value chains. At the moment, in the context of the African continental free trade area, we're looking very much 
at the development of a number of continental value chain initiatives. The automotive sector is an important one, clothing and textile is going to be included as well. But there are some uncomfortable questions we also have to ask in our quest for industrialization. And some of these relate to the impact of subsidies in our global trade partners and some of the prolific users of subsidies that are noted in the report here are of course our important sources of imports of manufacturers. And the question that does need to, uh, to be asked for African countries and perhaps also for other developing countries in a similar situation is where the subsidies in those countries actually circumscribed limit our prospects for industrialization. So a great deal of work needs to be done to focus on some of these important questions. As far as the digital economy and the service sector subsidies are concerned, I think this is a particularly important area currently for African countries and perhaps little explored in terms of the nature, the impact and the use of subsidies by African countries, but also the impact of subsidies in our trade partners on the development of our sectors and achieving legitimate public policy objectives such as financial inclusion or universal access to energy and communication services. The energy sector is particularly important and it's related of course to our climate transition, but extremely important because energy security is by no means guaranteed across the continent. As I sit here this afternoon, we will be experiencing what we call rather euphemistically load shedding a little bit later. There must be some remedies for these issues. In terms of the management and what we might call the administrative justice or due process issues, colleagues have already mentioned, of course, transparency, the notifications, and perhaps the waning impetus to, to notify subsidies to the WTO. Cursory glance through the notifications portfolio on the WTO website is rather discouraging to say the least. What is holding WTO members back from notification? And I think this is a particularly important country for those, those of us who may be impacted by those, those subsidies and perhaps not, not in a good way. So the international spillovers, certainly unless we have good information about these subsidies are very, very difficult to negotiate. Another very important issue, and, and this certainly came to the fore as we started negotiating the African continental free trade area and the various annexes to our protocol on trade and goods, which does focus on, on defense instruments, including subsidies too, is the lack of capacity policy, legal and institutional capacity at national level. At this point, if we take a look at the users of subsidies, then it's an extremely small, I mean, of countervailing investigations, it's an extremely small list of countries on the African continent. So there's a great deal of work that needs to be done in terms of information dissemination, capacity building, and bringing up to speed our capacity to effectively negotiate the design of our own good subsidy programs, but also being ready to take action in the case of negative international spillover effects. Thanks so much, Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you, Trudy, and uh, quite frankly, to um, all of our discussants. Uh, you really provided uh, some thought-provoking reflections, some of which you know, I'm, I'm still sort of processing in my mind, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will have a very good uh, conversation uh, around these topics. So uh, let me just ask um, uh, some of our authors, uh, or the authors of the report, uh, whether any one of them would like to come in uh, just a couple of minutes, because I, I do want to take uh, also questions from the audience uh, here in the room, and we also uh, have quite a few questions uh, online. So I don't know if uh, if there's any of our authors who would like to say a word. Um, mm -hmm. You, you want to go ahead, uh, Julia or Alex? Yeah. Um, thanks, and I'll be quick, but just to say thank you. I think those are all 
extremely thoughtful and very very helpful reflections and i i particularly liked your framing as well on jay in terms of the purpose of the report i think that that's a good way of looking at it um i want to pick up on this broader issue though of you know i think to answer the other question that andre praised at the start is there a common understanding i think no um and that's part of why we're trying to to take this this work that's kind of the job i mean at the moment uh, a bad subsidy is by definition somebody else's is is usually the working definition and, and that's being a bit facetious but it's also um it's also i think the reality of the very different perspectives and needs and i think even from our from our discussants we heard very different perspectives from where you stand and what you think you're trying to do but that brings me to a little bit the the point that chad made i think the problem is is that it, the good coordination you talk about or the good things are often the flip side or packaged with the things we don't want so let's look at agriculture we talk about we're helping farmers we talk about investing in the future we spend 16 percent of support on innovation biosecurity infrastructure extension services we spend the vast majority of it in handouts to individual farmers that goes by and large to to the wealthiest and largest farmers and encourages and can encourage input use and be environmentally harmful so when we think we're trying to do something good uh, this is exactly the moment where we need to come back to having a good objective is not enough it's understanding whether we're actually achieving that and whether we're um whether we're doing the good stuff in a way that it that gets us there and whether when we say we have a good objective that's what we're actually doing uh, because i think the um even when we look at some of the coordination issues so you're quite right to point out that some big players are now coordinating because they recognize the potential for mutually assured destruction uh, in terms of subsidy competition in an area like semiconductors that makes a lot of other people nervous you know sometimes coordination on subsidies makes those who are cut out or, or left out nervous and that's important in a world as you say where everybody's repricing risk so what is comparative advantage? What is concentration? How do other countries, and Trudy, I think, raised a number of important points on this. How do other countries fit in and get a foothold if the world is about the deepest pockets? So especially when we're looking at things at a global level, um, and I think your point, Chad, about GVCs is, is absolutely right. Actually, we don't know who we're subsidising sometimes in global value chains. Um, you know, you may think you're subsidising your domestic producers, but the ultimate beneficiary may actually be somebody else. That's another thing we need to look at. But especially when we're trying to get global outcomes, then the how we get that good coordination is very often packaged together with some of the some of the fact that we are are not necessarily putting out our efforts in the same way so I think we're pushing in the same direction in that the whole reason for trying to one of the important reasons for trying to tackle the the bad subsidies is precisely so that we have the resources and we have the time and we have the ability to tackle the things that we need to thanks thank you uh Julia uh, Alex you wanted to uh, come in also Maybe just uh, very briefly also to thank uh, our commentators with these extremely rich and interesting uh, remarks that they've made, maybe very briefly concerning what um, Andre and Chad have, have said. Andre's second reading, I think, of the study is probably closer to what the study actually wanted to achieve and, and certainly not the first reading. But also in regard to this data construction effort or, or, or trying to extend the current information base, obviously this report was not the place to do this. but. Um, Internally, we have tried to, to, to actually run some, some CGE simulations. And you have to, if you want to do that, you have to make some assumptions about the actual subsidy rates uh, in, in various sectors. And it's hugely, hugely difficult to make reasonable assumption about that. And one of the best actually things you can do, as Chad would know, is, is to use uh, applied CBD rates uh, that, that Chad has begun to um to collect many years ago as a proxy as a lower bound for such subsidy rates but again then the picture is very patchy so when you when you say this but there's the gta data as the report says there's very little analysis you can do with this gta data let's face it it's very useful but um given that it's a count of measures 
um, it's, it's very hard even to establish a ranking of who are the largest subsidizers because it is just that account of measures and you don't know actually the impact or the size of some of these measures as others have said. So we urgently need, and that's probably a very much of a longer term agenda to improve this information base. And I think the kind of comments we receive from academia and from experts like you uh, are important because we will need to set also some priorities. We will not probably be able to work on all issues and sectors uh, at the same time. And we are certainly, I think, gonna be for a while far away to measure the kind of positive externalities uh, that, that Chad would like, would like to measure, even though it is obviously very desirable to do so. I want to make one very, very quick remark also to Ti Chung Kwan, who talked about SND, uh, which, is, which is a very important issue, obviously. And, and, and incidentally, I've, I've written about SND about 20 years ago, and the subsidies agreement, Article 27.6, has promo, probably one of the best, most effective designs for SND, uh, which allows for a range of developing countries, that is not only LDCs, but other countries as well, to continue to provide export subsidies up to, until they reach a threshold of, I think, 3.25%. Uh, in a given product market. So it is, whether this is the right number or not, that's up for debate, but it is, it should have is a very effective and pragmatic implementation of this trade-off that you probably need certain types of subsidies more in a development context. While at some point when the trade uh, spillovers become too large, you need to call it a day. So thank you very much um, again for this rich discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, I can only say that I think uh, much, many, much more discussions uh, will need to be uh, uh, held on this topic. Let me now take a couple of the questions that we have online and, of course, also invite anyone here in the room if they would like to ask us something. Um, we have a question from Serena Jacobs that says environmental subsidies are surfacing more in the last few years and especially under local content requirement, which have caused a lot of challenges for members. Uh, what are your views on environmental subsidies fitting into the agenda in the report? So I don't know um, if any of our uh, authors would like to uh, come to this. I'm gonna read a couple of questions so that you can all uh, sort of think and maybe address several of them. Um, so we have another one uh, that basically looks at some from Sangwa Erneste. My question is, how can we know that subsidies granted by a government are distortive or appropriate under international trade because most governments try to defend the motive of sub subsidies that they, are, that they grant to help domestic industries grow? Uh, so it's an important question um, as well. Uh, we also have um, another uh, question from Mandusha Rambakusing, who asks that although subsidies are considered as bad, my query in whether small island states, my query is whether small island states, which have been harshly affected by the pandemic and will be further affected with current food problems, should be allowed to have a time bound derogation to provide subsidies for sustaining their economy. And I chose these questions because I think they, they show the challenges that we have, you know, in tackling these subsidies. Uh, three very, very important questions uh, that, uh, you know, have, have no easy answers, I believe. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to the authors of the report uh, to ask them whether they would want to uh, address uh, any one of this, um, any one of these questions. And maybe I'll start with our uh, colleagues online uh, who did not have an opportunity to comment uh, before. Uh, Brad, maybe can I, can I come to you and ask you whether you would like to address uh, uh, these questions? Uh, thank you very much, Annabelle. I think I, of those three that you um, highlighted, I think uh, I, I would maybe touch on the second, if only briefly, because I think some of my colleagues might have, um, might have better answers, uh, might be a better place for this. But um, uh, yes, and in the paper, we tried to recognize this difficulty um, uh, or the, the distinction between how, how governments might uh, rationalize a subsidy uh, and versus, and this may, of course, be, be very entirely genuine. It's not, there's no need to second guess uh, how that's represented, 
but but especially to emphasize then that the design matters. I think those are two words that you've already heard from from the co-coordinators many times um, uh, uh, to, today, and the paper in some senses keeps uh, coming back back to this. So um, the ch the chance to bring some economics to this question about um, you know regardless of how a quest, how it how a subsidy or for that matter other public policies might be uh, rationalized might what might be the the objective it's important to bring this sort of economic analysis to it and ask ourselves is this the sort of approach that works um, in terms of achieving that objective at what domestic costs and what are the spillovers internationally through trade investment and and as we say in the global commons so i, I hope that the paper brings that out in, in in a rich way that's not a sort of complete answer but that is at least a sort of the perspective that we were trying to take to that sort of question thank you uh thank you brad uh jose you would like to uh, come in yes I'll, I'll comment uh i'll kind of indirectly answer a couple of those questions I think one on, on, on the objectives of these subsidies, um, I mean, we, we, we note in the paper, you know, there is, there is a case where subsidies is first best. And that's the case, for example, as Chad mentioned, when you have a, a large social uh, benefit that, uh, you know, you, you cannot capture in, in, a, in a private solution. The, the concern that I have with that is what, when you read some of, and I know notifications are not common, <laughs> but when you see those, in many cases, it's very hard to figure out what the market failure is. So, yes, theoretically, there is a case where subsidies are first best, uh, but many times subsidies are, to be very frank, used for strategic purposes. So let's, let me put that out. Uh, on, on the other point that I, I heard about small islands, uh, I think that's an important thing because uh, the problem with these subsidies, and we mentioned this at some point, is uh, the big the, the players are the big countries. And these are the countries that have the resources to, to subsidize and counter subsidize. And the ones that are standing in the middle of the fire are actually the developing countries because they don't have the fiscal space to, to do the same. So that's, that's another area that needs to be thought about because uh, it creates a complication for the international arena. And that brings me to, I think, probably my, the, the third point I want to make uh, connected to all these, which is a, the last part of the title of the report is subsidy straight and international cooperation. Which the international cooperation is very important because as I think about this, we are in a kind of a, on a, in a, in a bad equilibrium and the only way to move to a better equilibrium will have to be with a cooperative solution. The incentives are, is we are kind of in a prisoner dilemma here. The incentive here is to free ride because as opposed to when you negotiate tariff, you cannot exclude someone from a deal of containing about providing subsidies. So that it has to be a solution. That's why I think the, the solution about subsidies need to be addressed at the multilateral level. So the WTO is very important for that. And, and, and the other one related to international cooperation is that when you talk about trade remedies in the form of unilateral countervailing actions, you are not really solving anything. You're just reflecting the problem because you are, you know, the subsidies are are still going to distort international prices. You probably protect yourself about it, but then you deflected the problem to the rest of the world. So again, just bring back the third part of this, the title of the paper about international cooperation will be very important. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. I know that Julia wants to come in. Just before you do, uh, I'm gonna also bring three other questions because maybe uh, also you or Alex would like to tackle uh, the three questions, which all of them relate to one uh, um, uh, aspect that the paper makes, which is the need for uh, more data, better data, uh, coordinated data collection, et cetera. So we have from Usman Yang, he says, is information on the level of support uh, in subsidies to services lacking due to capacity issues or countries withholding information? 
We have also another uh, question from uh, Karl Heinz uh, Nickel that uh, basically says, uh, can this report um, uh, benefit much more from the brilliant work that OECD has done on sexual, structural, environmental, and development impacts of agricultural subsidies? And then we have uh, Peter Parmentier saying, to foster discussions on subsidies, transparency is key. However, not every country or company may want to be transparent. How to overcome this conundrum? So you see here that in our chat, there is concern about, well, how do we address uh, this particular issue, particularly because we have made the point, the report makes the point that uh, data is not enough, or that we do not have sufficient data in this uh, in this area. So Julia, let me give the floor to you, and then Alex, I'll come to you for the final comments on this. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with the last two, the, the last question first. I think on small island states, that's a really good point, and it's perhaps also a good example of the kind of uh, the areas for need for positive coordination that Chad had mentioned. But as you do what you need to do um, in emergency support, and the historical mistake is usually too little, too late, um, not the opposite. The question is, how do you build something sustainable? And what we see with a lot of emergency support is uh, you end up funding zombie firms. So you're endlessly funding firms that would have failed anyway, rather than tiding people over who had a chance to make it. Or what you end up with, and this is, is often a case too, with uh, some kinds of subsidies, is instead of encouraging the development of a competitive market where you may have had a market failure, you end up building a couple of national champions and then 10 years later you discover you've got high consumer prices and not enough innovation. So you know, this is part of the what we were talking about uh, concretely in terms of, of how you design that support. Equally, the, the issue of environmental subsidies and local content is a very good one. You may want to use subsidies to incentivise, say, for example, renewable energy. But if at the same time you're, you have a local content which is raising requirement, which is raising the price of that. So wind turbines is a good example. They're produced only in a, a few countries globally, comparative advantage. So if you decide to spend your, your tax dollar on developing wind turbine capacity, then maybe you're actually cutting, cutting, going in the opposite direction. You're trying to incentivise people to use it, but you're raising the cost. So you end up um, sort of spending public money uh, inefficiently in both directions. I think the last questions on transparency and uh, services. I think services, one of the reasons is it's actually genuinely hard. I, I think there are a number of difficult conceptual issues in services. Um, I think clearly also the heavy presence of government services and public services uh, complicates things. Uh, in general, though, yes, there are lots of lessons um, from agriculture, including the scope to get better design when you have better information. And I think what we try to do over this report is, is to try and change the incentives for governments to provide that information, to realise what's at stake, as well as to look very seriously at how we can improve our own information collection. I mean, one of the things that we have to be careful about is not creating perverse incentives for people not to want to declare. So uh, sometimes that's, I think Alex mentioned that, one of the problems with counts is that if I only declare one really big subsidy, I look better than somebody who's actually reporting at a granular level lots and lots of subsidies, whereas in fact we want people to tell us at a granular level lots and lots of subsidies. So you know, I think it takes all different parts of the international system to push for efforts on this. We're hoping that governments see that it's in their own interest to be more transparent. We're hoping that our own efforts to increase that transparency will also create a virtual cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Uh, Alex, you want to come in and then very briefly, uh, Brad. Yeah, just very briefly on this data, um, trans data collection effort and, and trans the issue of transparency, uh, Peter Parmentier's question. Uh, in the report, we identify um, several reasons of why trans Transparency notifications, for instance, might not be forthcoming at, at, as they should. And one of the reasons I think Trudy also has mentioned it is certainly capacity, that it's, uh, it's time and resource intensive to collect this information. Uh, a second reason is probably also a fear of legal implications here in this institution. Uh, if one is too, too transparent, at least, at, at, at least for some countries who are maybe not, not, not yet sure how, how they should rate their own measure um, in terms of the international impacts. And, and the third reason is that countries might have simply 
maybe even innocently different views and of what is a subsidy. So some, some countries might simply not think of this particular measure as being a subsidy, while outsiders actually said, well, you should have maybe notified this, uh, this type of measure. So, so I, I wouldn't say that they are necessarily don't want to be transparent. Some of it is also they, they can't be, um, or they have um, simply also other reasons why, why this is not happening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, uh, Brad, you want to come in, please? And that, I think, would be our, our last comment. Uh, thank you, Annabelle. I just wanted to jump in with, I think, a very narrow point. But one thing that was such a good experience and I think uh, helpful was we learned in working together in the, the small group um, a lot about what each other is already doing, each of the other organizations. And we had some good discussions about you know, you know how how is information being collected? Because each organization has some involvement with this issue and, and some information. World Bank does, IMF does, OECD does, uh, OECD does, and WTO does. And when we think about um, you know how how to bring out more of this information and and bring it out publicly, part of the question is is looking at ourselves, what we're already doing, the areas in which we're already operating, and trying to kind of look at, you know, what we might draw from those existing exercises and, and, and um, pull this together, look for gaps, look for overlaps, and, and, and hopefully contribute by, by doing that. So I just wanted to throw that in there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brad. Uh, and uh, with that, let me say that I think we, we started um, in when, when thinking about this report, we started um, looking into, you know, what can an agenda, forward-looking agenda for these four international organizations uh, working together in this area B. And uh, we got, I guess, some very good suggestions uh, from, uh, from our discussants. Uh, and we also, uh, you know, uh, thought of this as a conversation starter. And we heard that there were 100 Chinese scholars debating the report uh, just a few days ago. Uh, we, you know, in our subsidies committee here at the WTO, our WTO members last week also touched upon the uh, report and some of the issues that it contained. And of course, we had uh, today here overall some 250 people uh, who were, uh, you know, uh, sort of wanting to learn more about this topic. So clearly, um, there are many questions. Our discussions, uh, I think, reminded us uh, very, very clearly of some of these uh, questions. So um, with this, I think that we conclude this event, but I can only think that this is really uh, the beginning of, uh, of much more work in this area that we need to do. Uh, with that, thank you all very much uh, for uh, joining us and have a good, uh, a good afternoon or a good morning. Thank you.